Agung Hujatnika, also known as Dr. Agung Hujatnika, received a doctorate degree from the Faculty of Art and Design at ITB. Since the early 2000s, Dr. Hujatnika has curated many major exhibitions at national and international levels, including 1001 Martian Homes, Indonesian Pavilion at Venice Biennale 2017, mm -hmm. Not a Dead End, Indonesia Encounters the Arab Region, Jogja Biennale in 2013, an exquisite corpse, Bandung Pavilion at the 9th Shanghai Biennale in 2012. In 2017, together with Charles Esche, Dr. Hujadnika created Art Turns, World Turns at the inaugural exhibition of Machan, the Museum of Modern and Contemporary Art in Nusantara. He was the initiator and artistic director of Instrumenta, International Media Art Festival in Jakarta from 2018 to 2019. And Dr. Hujatnika, who has been involved in several research projects of Indonesian and Southeast Asian art, including ambitions alignments in 2013 to 2015, and shaping Indonesian contemporary arts role of institutions in 2014 to 2017. His book, Kurasi dan Kuasa, on Kuter Kur Curatorial Practice and Power Relations in the Indonesian Art World was published by the Jakarta Art Council in 2015. So hello, Dr. Hujatnika. Good morning. Hi. Morning, Sabrina. Hello. hello. So I read that you have a very long history in curating exhibitions. Could you tell us a little bit about any recent uh, exhibitions that you've created throughout the pandemic, perhaps? Uh, yes, uh, thank you for the generous introduction, by the way. Um, yes, as we all know, um, I think many other curators also experienced the same thing in the last one or two years. Uh, many exhibitions and physical spaces have decreased due to, to the pandemic. But, um, uh, well, besides teaching and <clears throat> researching, I'm still teaching for the undergraduate and postgraduate programs for uh, curatorial studies. Um, I still managed to yeah, handle some exhibitions which had to be converted to online platform. And the recent one was the Contemporary Art Festival in Yogyakarta, which is called Art Jog, which just ended last August. Fantastic. That's amazing that we still can have uh, art exhibitions even in this pandemic. Fantastic. Okay. So to begin the first plenary session, I will be handing the screen over to you, Dr. Hujatnika. Okay. Thank you, yes. Sabrina. The screen is all yours. Thank you. And uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. A very good morning to everyone in Bandung and also everywhere else in Western part of Indonesia. To our honorable speakers and conference participants, wherever you are across the globe, I would like to extend you a very warm greeting. And allow, allow me to welcome you all again to this first plenary session of the ICON Arcade 2021 International Conference of Art, Craft and Design, which bears the title Fostering Creative Economy for Sustainable Development. And thank you very much for taking the time to participate in this first plenary session. And <clears throat> it is such a great honor and delight for me to be able to join you as the moderator for this session. Um, just to start again with the housekeeping note, uh, I think Sabrina has informed you that this conference is being live streamed on both YouTube and Zoom. So for you who have friends and colleagues who are keen to join us, but not registered yet, please kindly inform them that they can still stay tuned on the Icon Arcade YouTube channel. And also I'd like to encourage you to share today's conference to your social media networks. This session will run for about 70 minutes in total. And allow me to remind you again that in order to keep this session on time, you may write your responses or questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen during the presentation. And our speaker will respond to your comments in the Q&A session later. Our keynote session is entitled Networking Publics and Analysis of the Recent Work of Mona's Art Projects. And before I introduce you to our speaker, please enjoy this short video clip prepared by our team.
Hello everyone, my name is Callum Morton. I am Professor of Fine Art at Monash Art Design and Architecture in Melbourne, Australia. I'm also the Director of Monash Art Projects, uh, a research lab in the faculty that looks at um, the conception and production of public art, uh, permanent public art in particular. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to talking to you about the history of this lab, um, sharing with you some of the projects we've worked on and are currently working on, um, our methodology for working, and our connection to the broader research culture across the faculty and indeed the university. So I look forward to seeing you on the 29th and 30th of September at the uh, second ICON Arcade Conference. See you then. Uh, distinguished conference participants, ladies and gentlemen, this keynote deals with a question on the possibilities to work within the bureaucratic structures of permanent public art opportunities and how to create artworks that is open, critical, and inclusive. Monas Art Projects, or MAP, was established in the Faculty of Art Design and Architecture at Monas University in Melbourne, Australia in 2013. Their main mission is to connect the community of artists, architects, designers, thinkers, and makers to public art opportunities. And in the Australian context, these opportunities are largely shaped by percent for our art allocations across a number of sectors, both public and private. Alongside the research, development, and translation of permanent and temporary public projects, MAP also runs workshops teaches graduate and undergraduate students, consult to local councils and industries, organize conferences, and publish writings by artists and art historians. MAP is an organization that sees itself as a type of node that reaches out into a network of creative practitioners and thinkers, especially those who are interested in negotiating the multiple potential audiences for public art and the role it can play in the formation and sustainability of discursive and progressive publics. As part of this ambition, they privilege the inclusions of new voices into the field. To date, MAP have worked with a heterogeneous and interdisciplinary cohort of artists, including indigenous, non-indigenous, and LGBTQI artists, as well as artists with so-called disabilities. This keynote will introduce the audience to a range of completed and speculative large-scale research projects to illuminate the ways in which MAP works and describe its potential future. And it is an honor for me to introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Callum Morton, to this conference. Professor Callum Morton is an artist and professor of fine art and at Monash Art Design and Architecture in Melbourne and he is also the current director of Monas Art Project. He has been exhibiting nationally and internationally since 1987, including his solo shows at the Santa Monica Museum of Art, 1999, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Sydney, 2003, the Indian Triennial in New Delhi, 2004, and Australian Center for Contemporary Art in Melbourne, 2005. Professor Morton represented Australia at the Venice Biennial in 2007, with his work Valhalla, and among amongst other uh, public projects that he has completed include a work entitled Hotel 2008 on the East Isling Freeway in Melbourne, the Permanent Pavilion Grotto 2009 for the Fundament Foundation in Tilburg in the Netherlands, Silver Screen 2011 for the new location of MUMA in Melbourne 2010, and the Mon Monument Park in Melbourne's Docklands in 2014. In 2011, his work was subject of a retrospective at Haida Museum of Modern Art in Melbourne. In 2014, he, he has participated, he participated in the 19th Sydney Biennale titled Imagine What You Desire. And in 2017, he completed the outdoor work 
called Sisyphus in Silkeborg in Denmark for the European Capital of Culture. Professor Morton also works across other art disciplines. He has designed, for instance, uh, a number of theater performance uh, uh, stage, including the for production of uh, a performing art uh, presentation, Other Desert Cities in 2013, and Endgame 2015 for Melbourne Theatre Company. And his recent collaboration with performing artists includes a set for Chunky Move Dance Company's major production entitled Yung Lung in 2021. And he is currently completing other multiple public commissions internationally and nationally. So without further ado, uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Cal Morton. Thank you very much, Agu, um, for that very generous introduction. I'm just going to share my screen and hopefully we will get the PowerPoint active. Can you just see the full screen there? Yep, okay, that's great. Um, so thank you uh, very much for the invitation to speak today. It's a real privilege to be here with you and I hope you're all surviving the, the pandemic um, as best you can and you are staying safe. Um, I had a great pleasure to visit ETB uh, a number of years ago and it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful institution with a great um, art school with a long tradition and it was a great pleasure um, to visit them. I'd like to begin as we traditionally do in Australia to pay my respects to the traditional custodians of the land and waters that Monash Uni operate, University operates on, the Boonwurrung and Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and extend that respect to elders past, present and emerging and welcome uh, any other First Nations uh, people with us today. Um, in the Faculty of Art, Design and Architecture in which um, MAP is housed, we have a number of Indigenous colleagues and we've been fortunate enough to work closely with them on uh, some projects in, in MAP. Um, um, some of which I will talk to today if I've got enough time to get through it all. Um, and it's always incredibly illuminating to uh, listen to their stories and um, share, and for them to share their knowledge with us. So we're very fortunate to have them. Um, today I want to talk about MAP, as Agung said. It's a research lab in the faculty at MARTA. I will talk to you a, a little bit about the context in which uh, we operate. Um, the scope of our activities more broadly, and then concentrate on a few key examples of the main we do with colleagues in the creation of permanent public artworks, uh, some of which have been built and others that remain um, uh, perhaps forever speculative, although, um, of course, uh, speculative works are still works. On to the next slide there, does everyone see? Yep. Is there a slide there? Yes, we see your slide, Professor Morton. Good, okay. So as I said, I'm inside, um, We our lab sits inside Monash Art Design and Architecture. Um, uh, our faculty sits inside the largest university in the Southern Hemisphere. It began in the 60s as a young and politically and socially progressive university. It today has four campuses uh, across Melbourne and a number across the globe. It has 78,000 students and 40% percent plus percent of which are interna international. And it's known for its STEM-based disciplines, particularly science and medicine. Um, we, are, we are in Melbourne, uh, which is uh, a city of around 5 million people in the south of Australia. So that's one of the major capitals. Um, recognised traditionally as the cultural capital of Australia, although I'm sure Sydney would um, and others would would, would argue that. Um, um, though I would have to say that um, congratulations to Indonesia for putting the creative con economy as a sort of central plank in its policy because, um, you know, I think Australia actually is quite backward in its support for the arts and education um, today. For instance, during the pandemic, when most other industries receive government support, for what they do, the artistic and tertiary education sectors receive nothing at all. So there's a bit of a culture war. 
and happens in, in, in our democracy and a, a real issue with how the arts are valued. I know we're not alone, but um, it does seem to me that Indonesia has a different way of looking at that. Um, we are based at the Caulfield campus, which is the second biggest campus known as the Creative Precinct. Um, and I show this image because um, it's a very famous work now by an artist called Agatha Gosnake, which, um, which is on the ground plane here, which turns this uh, activity area into a kind of emotional uh, textual landscape. Um, so uh, in 2012, the faculty uh, um, uh, established a number of research labs um, in the various disciplines. Uh, it was a partly the, a way to um, aggregate our research and enable a, a type of cross-disciplinary and collaborative culture inside and outside the faculty. And, uh, you know, indeed, we are very keen to collaborate across the university, recognising the great opportunity our context affords. So, you know, a lot of this talk is really about talk, talking to the context um, the clear context in which we work and how we sort of shape what we do to, to fit that context. And we're all, all, always working, you know, finding opportunities to work uh, with other discipline areas. Um, some of the research labs, uh, just by example, in design, there is the Health Collab, which began by, um, I'll just check the chat here, just hang on. Um, Sorry, uh, the health color, which began designing the interface for the bionic eye and has more recently been focusing on transforming the hospital patient experience. And you can imagine during the pandemic, they were very busy, particularly around the, the way one um, uh, was particularly around the way um, uh, health workers were getting infected with the virus. So they did a lot of work on um, analyzing and um, shaping the way the PPE uh, would roll out in hospitals. Uh, XYX lab, which looks at gender in space, uh, particularly um, safety for women in the city. Um, the mobility design lab, which looks at, they designed a, a Volgren bus and the more recently they've been looking at the impact of uh, user experience and, and the choice of public transport. And the rise, um, which is now a centre um, and would probably be known to many of you in Indonesia, um, I would imagine. Um, it stands for Revital Revitalising Informal Settlements and Their Environments. That was funded by the Wellcome Trust and the Asia Bank. Um, and uh, it's rolled out a number of um, uh, projects in Indonesia and in Fiji in informal settlements. It looks uh, at improving infrastructure to stop flooding. It um, improves uh, sanitation um, and sewage through natural systems. And that's a terrific project that now exists in the faculty known as uh, the Informal Settlements, uh, Informal Cities Lab. Um, so those, those four labs, uh, three of them are in design and one sits inside architecture. Construction 4.0 is a fairly um, hard thing to kind of grasp, except basically it's looking at the fourth industrial revolution, um, which is based around our ubiquitous connectivity and how that connectivity uh, and um, can improve um, systems, construction systems, um, and, and how the AI and new technologies intersect with that. Um, uh, Monash Urban Lab, another architecture one, focus on, focuses on three areas of investigation, sustainable and inclusive cities have done a lot of work, for instance, on aged care and disability housing, um, uh, urban infrastructure systems and visualising urban futures, and they sit between, it's kind of this unique integration of um, public uh, um, practice-based design and urban planning research. And a more recent one is the Emerging Technologies Lab, which which is design ethnography basically um, and looks at future mobilities, um, energy futures, technology and sustainability, future health and the future of work and learning. So how does the 
only dedicated fine art, uh, only f dedicated fine art lab. So there's all those, you know, labs in architecture and design. But how does the only um, fine art lab fit into this context of what is essentially applied research? Um, you know, we know that art can be fugitive and dis difficult discipline to grasp, um, often willfully critical in its outlook, um, and often best viewed from outside, to be honest. But we also know that artists are often the most entrepreneurial people, certainly some of the most entrepreneurial people I know, just, just to survive as an artist is an incredibly entrepreneurial thing to, to do. Um, and they can teach us a lot of things about how to expand and use our imaginations and apply it to different fields. Um, so Matt was established in 2013 to work with individual artists and artist-led teams to research, develop, and indeed translate permanent and temporary public art uh, projects. Uh, as Agung said, we see ourselves as this node in a network um, that connects artists and thinkers and so on to other, in other knowledge systems and methodologies, and sometimes operating simply as a connector. Um, and there are a number of reasons why we started Matt with a focus on public art. The first thing would have been is that um, the interdisciplinary nature of public art itself. It's not public art is not really art as one imagines it. It's certainly not art in the sort of classic sense of the individual artist in the studio. Um, it's collaborative and hybrid, and it works across. Um, it works across a number of areas. And in fact, um, and I'll show a bit later, most of the people that work in that um, are, are architects. And we need that skill base in architecture to deliver these projects. Um, not design so much, uh, certainly they're involved, but um, so definitely sort of architecture. And um, so it's a more industrial um, type of process. Um, and so that sits very nicely in the faculty when you've got those three disciplines co-located and, um, and actually art design and architecture co-located in one place is quite unusual in Australia. So we're, we're a bit unique in Australia as a faculty. And also there's the iterative design modes of, uh, of, of design, uh, iterative uh, design modes of architecture and design and in particular in the studio cultures and Matt is kind of more like that than it is like a traditional um, artist studio, though it's a bit of a hybrid. Um, another reason was that we have uh, a number of artists teaching in fine art, including myself, that have had significant opportunities um, to work in public art and have made some substantial work. So there's a so as part of their broader practice, so recognizing that all artists work in diverse ways. Uh, uh, across a number of different areas, um, but as part of that, they have significant um, capacity in that, so it made a lot of sense um, to do that. Um, the other reason was that um, at the heart of the campus at uh, Caulfield um, is Monash University Museum of Art, or MAMA, uh, as it's known. Um, and the head of MAMA, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a brilliant museum, perhaps the preeminent university art museum in the country has a, uh, a, a significant collection of um, Australian contemporary art. It has a program of, um, that includes many international artists alongside national artists. Um, and the director, Charlotte Day, who came to Monash not long after I did, she had a, 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 a long experience working as an independent curator um, and um, particularly on public art projects um, and so she, um, it, there was already a public art program at Monash um, from the previous director, Max Delaney, who is um, now the director of Australian Centre for Contemporary Art and who we also work with uh, quite, a, quite a bit. Um, but she um, um, drove this public art program on, through, on the one hand, if you look at the bottom right image, um, she, uh, and the sort of top in the middle, uh, the work by Emily Floyd, um, had this commission outside the museum uh, in the Ian Potter forecourt, it's called. And then those works often ended up uh, somewhere else across the university. So it's a bit like a monster model that um, the work is commissioned and then finds a home and is relocated. Um, but equally, there was a percent for art scheme, which is percentage tied to the development of new buildings. At Monash, there have been um, 
you know, an explosion of building in the last 15 years. Um, and a number of um, deans in faculties and were very interested in having artists make work. Um, um, so, you know, we're kind of, and contribute to the, the sort of atmosphere and place of the university. So uh, actually in the top top left-hand corner is the work that Matt did. Um, uh, we did the funnel and the sort of bottom um, uh, tier of this new skin that was applied to one of these 60s buildings that was falling apart. So it was adaptive reuse. And my, I've got slides to talk about it, but I might run out of time to talk about that. Um, So MAP, um, as I said, we're a team of artists, architects, designers, thinkers, and makers. There's always only three of us there. Uh, there's myself and then a couple of others, Helen Walter, who actually start, I taught as a student um, um, and was an artist for a while before switching to architecture. Paul has just joined us recently, but you know, below uh, the cast of those that have worked in the studio, uh, in, uh, in the lab over the time, Many, most of whom, as I said, are architects. We've 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 um, worked on over 150 projects. The bulk of which are permanent public artworks funded by uh, Percent for Art, um, like in the university. But um, Percent for Art scheme opportunities in both the public and private sector. So in the public, it's city councils and uh, state governments. And I can talk about that a bit more broadly later, perhaps. Uh, in private, through building developments. Um, we've been shortlisted for about 50 projects, which is a significant thing in the kind of in the in the way art projects are rolled out, uh, public art project opportunities are rolled out in Australia. And we've been awarded 16, built seven, and currently have six under development. So for a little team, we're very busy, um, and we're currently expanding that to include a team of scholars, so sort of like a plug-in um, traditional research arm. Um, and to develop a more um, specific text-based research. And as, as a good men work with a diverse range of collaborators, um, some of who you might know in the middle there, Brooke Andrew, the last um, artistic director of the Sydney Biennale, he's on staff at Monash and we've done uh, projects with him, one of, one of which I will show. Um, Nikos Papastagiatis might, um, might be familiar to you. Um, Max Delaney is on there. Um, the artist Jeremy Della, who the British artist Jeremy Della, who we recently uh, did a project. Uh, it was commissioned by Acker, and we we actually made it for him. Uh, and we're waiting to for that project to to um, to happen. It's kind of basically sitting there while we're in lockdown. Um, so fingers crossed that's going to happen in the next month or so as we uh, vaccination rates go up and we come out of lockdown. So just to go through some of the things we do um, in education, in education, we started a graduate certificate of public art um, uh, and uh, um, in its students um, work on a range of real world, real, real world projects that they conceive the context for. And these can be from socially engaged, uh, integrated participatory works to symbolic you know, objects in space. Um, and uh, we, we develop them and then we try and realise them um, with those students. We also teach into a Masters uh, of Architecture um, studio on, on public art. The new head of architecture actually has a history of working through a practice called MUP that she worked in when she worked at Central St Martins in London. Um, um, and so there are a lot of synergies there between us. Um, well, we find one conference called Let's Go Outside, Making Art Public, a few years ago, like this, a two-day event uh, comprising, comprising significant keynote presentations, um, uh, better keynotes than I'm delivering today, I'm sure. But um, uh, in the left-hand corner top is Nicholas Baum, who um, Australian curator who is uh, currently the dir director of the Public Art Fund in New York. Uh, Jonathan Jones, the Indigenous artist, uh, talked, of course, in the bottom left hand corner, Are uh, Damoan from Rungrupa, he came to speak, which was great. Uh, and Tanya Bruguera came, gave an incredible, um, the Cuban artist gave an incredible keynote. We're publishing a book on that conference, should be out this year. Um, we publish, um, so we published um, uh, you know, collect um, artists, um, various collections of artists' writings. Um, um, 
we've also we also um, co-publish um, Memo Review, which is um, a critical review journal um, that is online um, every Saturday, um, and um, and uh, we we combine uh, we collect all the reviews together each year for an annual annual um, annual publication. Um, we have a Bachelor of Art History and Curating in the faculty. We also have um, one of the few practice-based curatorial PhD programs in the world. Um, and um, those students get a chance to, to write. So in a sense, this magazine is cultivating new writers and thinkers, new art historians and theorists. We work on exhibitions, so we bring artists in. Sometimes, as many of you might be aware, that the, the sort of um, overly bureaucratic, bureaucratic processes of public art um, with its kind of endless milestones, insurances, um, um, design developments, um, and just meetings more broadly, uh, turn a lot of artists off. So in a way, what MAP does is, uh, well, we say that we're going to support the artist uh, to enable them to participate in it without all those burdens necessarily. So we have the experience to do that. Um, and for the artists to have some sort of resistance to it, we invite them in um, on the one hand to do workshops, but we also um, sometimes produce work with them. Um, so Nick, Nicholas Mangan, who is an artist, a really excellent artist in the faculty, um, this, this project's called Termite Economies. He came in and we, we modelled and... 3D printed this work um, for him. Uh, he does a lot of work um, looking at the unstable relationships between nature and culture, um, particularly the starting point for this work, um, Termite Economies, is based on an anecdote that the CSIRO, who is a, a big science organisation that started at Monash and is now, now sort of sits alongside it, um, they research termite behaviour in the hope that the insects might one day lead to humans to gold deposits. So. So it was a proposal to kind of exploit um, the natural activity of, of termite uh, uh, colonies for economic gain, very typical of the way Nick works, won't go on to it. But we're currently, because Nick came in and worked on these projects, he also then uh, has participated in a, um, in a couple of public art opportunities, um, one of which we're waiting to hear uh, at the moment. Um, we do uh, we do work uh, across performance largely through some of my interests, but um, 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 in set design, um, works for the Melbourne Theatre Company. Um, um, uh, this is the end game one, as well as this was a set for the um, uh, Young Lung production um, for Chunky Move, who are a major contemporary dance company in Melbourne. Um, this, this project is just sitting there and has been sitting there all year. Uh, it's had two false starts, so hopefully next year it'll be performed. Uh, we run workshops um, as, a, as an important part, as I just mentioned with Nick Mangan, an important part of um, bringing people in who wouldn't necessarily think that they could work on these permanent public projects. So in our mind, one of the simplest ways to get good public artists and bring good artists into it. So a lot of good artists, I know it's a woolly term, but a lot of good artists um, resist um, um, resist um, permanent public art. So um, we um, we offer kind of workshops around these opportunities, which are very informal, um, kind of hybridised workshops, sitting between, as I mentioned before, you know, a kind of studio practice in fine art and one in design. Um, but it's very informal. Uh, we sit around for a few days. Um, swapping drawings, swapping uh, notes, reading things, um, slowly developing things on the computer and so on. Um, and, you know, indeed, it's kind of, it has worked uh, on a number of significant occasions. So we have an example at the moment of uh, a large public work that's going on alongside a freeway in Melbourne um, by an artist called Marilyn Van Kauswick, who is actually a jeweller and had uh, only worked on a small scale and had no sense that... Um, she could work at, the, at a larger scale, but because, because of the particular type of material thinking that was in her work, we thought it would convert very well to a particular type of opportunity in public art, and we won the commission and we're doing it at the moment. So just uh, an example of one of the workshops was we worked with back-to-back -back theatre um, 
I don't know if many of you have heard of Vestavik Theatre. I'll talk a little bit about them. They're a theatre company based in Geelong, which is a, 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 a small, uh, a, a sort of large town, I guess it is, um, just outside of Melbourne. It's a kind of major regional centre, basically. Um, on this opportunity, uh, the National Gallery of Victoria Pavilion, National Gallery of Victoria is the, is the, is the large um, state institution, um, very active museum, hosts all sorts of events and has an extraordinary collection um, when it was able to collect, you know, across the world, you know, in the early part of the 20th century. They had this pavilion competition, which is largely for young architects. Um, um, and, uh, you know, it's a little bit like a certain time pavilion and so on. Um, so we approached Back to Back Theatre, who have been working for over 30 years, making an incredible body of work. They're known um, internationally. Um, um, they, you know, they make, um, they, you know, they question the assumptions we have about what theatre can be, but they also question the assumptions we hold about ourselves and others, particularly around this notion of disability. All the, all the, um, all the actors have a form of so-called disability. Um, these are some of the production stills from some of their work, Food Court, um, Ganesh and the Third Reich, which was the story of uh, the elephant-headed god Ganesh travelling through Nazi Germany to claim, reclaim the swastika, which is, of course, an ancient Hindu symbol. Um, and that's Simon Laity, one of the actors uh, um, playing Hitler. So we ran this workshop. Uh, this is Robbie Croft, one of the artists down there who produces these extraordinarily expressive um, pastel, for all, all pastel drawings. Mark Deans was there. We ran a workshop where we set up computers and we took their drawings and converted them into digital um, images um, straight away and then had a conversation back with them about those images. We talked to them about a pavilion. We framed that we framed um, the competition and they sort of made work about shelter actually. Um, and Simon Laherty, who was the actor who was playing Hitler, made this thing called the, he called it the homeless zombie, zombie villain lair. Uh, it's a very, very specific world of the homeless zombie, you know, with very specific places for where tools are and where the house was. So it was kind of a map of that, that uh, environment. So we took this map and we did a number of iterations of, of possible outcomes. Um, but we took this map and we exploded it into a... Um, into a steel uh, roof system um, that was kind of connected to at the NGV. There's a very famous um, Leonard French glass, stained glass ceiling. Um, and we, we attach these curtains to it um, that were taken from Robbie's the series, uh, Robbie's drawings, these expressive drawings. And so this series of curtains was mechanized and would be constantly moving um, through the space. We didn't get it, it was speculative, but we really love that. Um, we really love that uh, um, whole process with Back to Back, and we're working with them on a number, another project at the moment. So um, we do temporary works. Um, we work with an artist collected called Damp, who has been a collective for in, in, in Melbourne for over 20 years in various states uh, and forms. Um, they, um, they uh, a, a, um, a curatorial candidate in the PhD program, Rosemary Ford, did her PhD about damp. And uh, as part of her PhD, she did a year long um, series of exhibitions and events and so on um, uh, with damp. And that included this in the, in the main um, gallery at, at Monarch Design and Architecture. This kind of retrospective and timeline of their work, including the large pencil that I showed you. So they came to us uh, and we worked with them to build this pavilion, this temporary pavilion um, that would act as a kind of stage for performance, but also as a, a space for exhibition and teaching. So it needed to be open air and enclosed. So we built this structure and then over the course of uh, six months, um, they would do various events. And um, each time they would add a bit to the to the uh, to this kind of pristine form, and and I guess if you like, sort of corrupt it. And then, as I said, you know, earlier, the bulk of what we do 
is permanent public artwork. So I'm just going to talk to talk to a couple of a few of those projects um, quickly. I don't know how I'm going for time actually. Um, um, so the first project that really kicked off Matt was a project called Monument Park. It was an artist-led, so I was the artist, um, collaborative public project that integrated sculpture and architecture and landscape elements. Um, worked with uh, McBride Charles Ryan architects and Oculus landscape architects. Um, in my work, I had been doing these things I call cover-ups, which are resin sculptures of covered, you know, in this instance, covered, um, you know, colonial figures, um, covered paintings, um, and so on. And so I kind of took this idea um, and we workshopped it uh, for Monument Park. And the idea was to take these, um, draw this kind of intersection between colonialism and modernism, uh, which is, you know, clear. Um, on, and we can talk about that um, more more um, uh, later, but um, take some of the, if you like, founding fathers or colonial figures uh, in the sculptures around Melbourne and a very famous down the bottom right sculpture called Vault, which was once in the city square when we had a city square uh, in, in Melbourne um, and has since been moved multiple times, actually now has a home outside the Australian Centre for Contemporary Art. Um, so I took these, took these sculptures and we scanned them. Um, so this is, for instance, this is the, one of them, the, the, um, the Marquis of Linlithgow is a former governor of Victoria. So we scanned these, you know, we got cherry pickers and um, 3D scanned them. Um, I don't have a photo of that kind of process. I couldn't find it, unfortunately. Um, then we brought them into the computer uh, we covered them, draped them inside a, a kind of program, and then we broke them open. So in a sense, the sort of figures were evacuated and we broke them open to make uh, these new kind of, you know, shelters, if you like, um, seating spaces for the park. Um, the, um, the place where the sculptures were being cited was on a dock, so we couldn't pour actual concrete um, um, because they'd be too heavy. So we used a thing called um, GRC, which is glass reinforced concrete, which is actually a lot more environmental than concrete. We know that concrete is terrible for the environment. So the glass elements in it are reclaimed and recycled materials. And um, the mix of the concrete design uses fly ash. Fly ash is a, a kind of new product that's used in, um, has been trialed a lot in kind of new concrete production and other pozzolons and, and, and um, that are produced from waste products. Um, so the finishes are ecologically friendly. Um, water-based materials and give off no pollutants. So, you know, it was a, it was a, um, particularly in terms of this conference, it, 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 it was a kind of interesting process to go through uh, lightweight structures. We also used um, uh, CNC, which is communi you know, communi computer numerically controlled robots, which I'm sure many of you know, um, for, to produce these, to produce these works. And so this is uh, some photos of them in place in the Docklands. Um, they were colonised by skaters and climbers um, straight away. Um, that's Vault, actually. That's the modest one. This is what it looked like a few years ago uh, from the air. The ground plane uh, was based on the Hoddle grid, which is the grid that Melbourne is planned around. Um, and Docklands is a kind of extension of that grid. So Docklands extended the, third, uh, uh, the city by a third in about 10 years. It was the most ex ex extraordinary sort of population um, um, and, and uh, growth of the city. Uh, and so uh, the ground plane is, uh, is, is the hot uh, rug made of concrete that then sort of over, that, that, uh, goes up and swallows these uh, sculptures. Um, you know, I've done a number of other ones of these. Um, this is at a school in Melbourne using, again, a, 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 a sort of more traditional sculpture to create, to create a new one and a new seat for, for, for kids. Uh, Emily Floyd um, is an artist who also teaches at Monash University. Um, she constructs social places, spaces to, um, I guess, re-invoke um, the utopian spirit of modernity 
um, one that is kind of open, inclusive, free, provisional, and and gen generative. Um, this is a work from the Venice Biennale in 2015 in the Arsenale called Labor Garden. So she calls it a social sculpture. So um, so this uh, kind of modular assemblage on one side, it's sheer. On the other side, it's open, and then there's open uh, open uh, libraries. Um, it spells out the word labor garden. So these works that I'm going to show, they all spell out a word using this kind of um, stylized design or Bauhausian kind of design. Um, and then the shelves at the back uh, and in the drawers um, are stacks of um, stacks of um, uh, political pamphlets. Um, um, yeah, journals, PDFs, and so on. So you can sit around and you can read uh, um, various um, things um, while you're sitting there. This work, uh, This Place Will Always Be Open, is a work uh, that was commissioned by Mama, uh, as I mentioned before, and now lives up, um, up uh, lives actually at Caulfield. Um, the title and conceptual framework of This Place Will um, called This Place Will Always Be Open is drawn from the experimental student struggle at Monash University through the 60s and 70s. Monash was, as I said, pro progressive uh, and quite socially explosive um, in the 60s and 70s. So she wanted to reactivate and, and nod to that tradition. Um, and uh, the books that were in the library, uh, which form the back of these seats, uh, all reference that period of time. Um, so the work we did with her recently, Open Space, is a continuation of these earlier projects. Similarly, it's a social space. Here, the P in Open uh, is a purple and green of the suffragette movement. Um, um, and, it w and it deconstructs the word open um, into individual letters that act as pointers, if you like, um, to this revitalised space between two, and she describes it, two sort of phallic objects has a very nice relationship to this building that you can see through here, which is uh, by a very famous modernist architect in Australia called Harry Seidler. Um, this is Australia Square, and, and he always included um, significant modernist artists in his foyers, and um, as is you know, fairly typical of you know, modernist architects of that time. So this is a solar wit mural, so the, there is a sort of, you know, um, a conversation between those two things. And Emily sort of saying that she squeaks between two phalluses. I mean, Emily is from a family of uh, toy makers um, and often did sort of blown up toys as some of her public works. And there's a very big um, um, Alexander Calder cross shears work outside Australia Square. And as a toy maker, if you know their work, Grand Sir Calder, um, Calder um, uh, she, she um, was very pleased to make reference to that as well. And extends up the stairs as well. Um, just looking at the Q&A here. Um, maybe I can do that at the end. Is that right? Is that what we're going to do? Or rather than respond yes, now? Yes, we'll... Professor Morton. I think we can do the Q&A later after your presentation. You may continue, okay, please. Thank you. Thank you. Michael. So Brooke Andrew, who I mentioned before, who's a, um, um, a very interesting artist, uh, scholar and um, curator, directed the um, Sydney Biennale, the last one, which was actually, a, unfortunately, a, a Biennale that was um, cut short by the, or certainly, you know, highly restricted by the, um, the pandemic, um, but nevertheless, um, it was simply a major event to have. Mobohina was a work that was um, a kind of opportunity uh, and they were dubbed, you know, bloodthirsty outlaws. And so the Melbourne City Council wanted to make a monument that reflected on that um, and, and updated our kind of uh, perception and conversation with uh, um, uh, um, um, uh, the Indigenous communities involved in um, the country wars. Um, uh, sorry, just lost something here. 
So, um, so in the, in the work, there are six brightly coloured um, newsstands um, that are the combination of the Aboriginal flag, which is black, red and yellow, and the Australian flag, which is black, red and blue, obviously. Um, uh, there's a, a child swing um, and then this con concrete um, seat, if you like. So the seat is uh, where, it's where you can sit and sort of reflect on that and subscribe into the na other names of Tinamora and Mulbahina. Around it is a, an Indigenous garden um, that is known for its uh, medical properties, as I understand. I can't, can't remember that completely. But And inside each of the newsstands, there is a... Um, there is a copy of um, uh, a, a facsimile of uh, articles that talk about the frontier wars and talk about this history. So it's a symbolic space you can go and you can sit and reflect on um, uh, the history that, as it was written in the past, and what that history means today. Um, you know, it's a it's an incredible work, really. So they wanted it to be a, a focus for contemplation and understanding about intergenerational trauma, which obviously is a big thing, and anger and the need for proper recognition for Indigenous communities. Uh, here in the background, there is a building called, um, actually I don't know what it's called, but it's designed by Ashton Raggett McDougall. And there is a very particular tradition of architecture in Melbourne. We kind of call it the figurative tradition um, uh, that came out of post-modernity. And in and um, the um, the um, veranda or the balconies of that building form the image of a very famous Indigenous leader called William Willem Barrack, who was based out of Corinduk, uh, which is in Healesville. He's a very important artist and and leader and negotiator with white communities. So it's a great image. Um, Daniel is well known for uh, his very um, playful and material video works um, and he's a great kind of material uh, thinker and some of the works are he's simply dripping paint um, to form colour bars. I don't know if you have colour bars but it's, it's when there is a pause in the reception of uh, of a, of a broad television broadcast, we call them colour bars. Maybe you have something more. Uh, 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 with something where you're more kind of plastic than paint ever could be, they're, they're luminous. Um, this is to show you. So um, for painted light, um, um, he the opportunity was on again down at Geelong, where back to back a base. Um, he um, it was on the new Geelong Performing Arts Centre, so it was a state funded commission. Um, and he filmed paint dripping. So, unlike the other works that um, have a certainly have a very um, strong political um, and social um, uh, context to them. This work is much more poetic, much more material based. He filmed the paint dripping and uh, over the course of the evening, the paint just drips one colour over another. Simple as that. I've got a bit of a video to show you. So there's 24 columns of 18 lights um, so he filmed the, the paint and then transferred it, as you might know, it's pretty common these days, transferred it to, um, to, um, transferred it to the lights. So it sets up an array, a grid. Um, which plays this, it's in slow motion, this video has been sped up a bit. Okay. 
just keep looking up. Um, so I just want to know how I'm doing for time, Nagum. Maybe another uh, four minutes or five, maybe. Five minutes, okay. Yeah. Um, might, um, okay, this South Bank Commission, um, this was a work we didn't get, um, which really broke my heart a bit. Sometimes the works you don't get do break your heart. Um, I worked uh, with, uh, I was the artist, with uh, an Indigenous artist called Yuani Scars um, uh, on a project down at South Bank outside a school in Melbourne called the VCA. Um, and um, and um, my work in the past, I used to, I, I've been known for making um, models of architecture and animating them with light and sound. Uh, this is a model I made for an exhibition in Scotland many years ago of um, Captain Cook's cottage, which is a cottage that was that he, Captain Cook, lived in that was shipped out stone by stone from the UK and rebuilt in Melbourne. Actually, many people, many tourists who come to Australia think it's the first house that was ever in Australia, but in fact, it was a kind of gift. So I filled it with this very um, violent soundtrack. I also, I spoke about this hotel work. Um, I mean, Agung mentioned this hotel work, which is a work that sits alongside the East Link Freeway, a work that is kind of like a cartoon. It's an impossibly thin um, uh, two-third scale um, version of a hotel sitting in a toxic field um, on the side of a freeway. Uh, and at night, 12 lights come on and each hour, uh, one goes off until the wee hours of the morning. Um, and uh, I mean, one of the things that public art does, we think, I think, is that it can open up new narratives. And this work certainly does that because um, people don't, it's kind of an anti-public work or an anti-monument if you like, because because it's because it is um, something that might otherwise appear beside a freeway, um, um, you know, people think for moments that it's actual. So, um, and uh, this is the work Valhalla that I did in Venice, which had this interior uh, with a three-quarter scale um, um, corporate foyer that was also interactive with sound. Often you sound a lot in my work. So I had a history of working with architecture. Yuani worked uh, works with um, blown glass. Uh, and she makes these extraordinary black yams. Yams, the yams were uh, a very common food source for indigenous um, um, people um, uh, that was, and that food source was basically eroded by colonization. So she makes these black yams, or they makes different colored ones, but the black, one, the black ones, uh, the most common. Uh, and each yam is, uh, is a body of an Aboriginal person. So they have uh, a real kind of impact, particularly on mass. So we wanted to work together and we approached her. So um, I, I wanted to, we took, uh, well, we took this treasury building, which is in Spring Street in, um, um, in, in Melbourne, which is where um, Parliament House is. Uh, it's the old treasury building. It used to be the building where they um, held the bullion from the gold rush uh, Melbourne was became very wealthy uh, from the gold rush, um, and they used to yeah. So that material extracted from the ground, it's kind of you know was held in this building. Uh, it's a it's actually an amazing building by a nineteen year old architect called J J Clark, built in the eighteen fifties, um, a sort of example of Renaissance revivalism. So we love the building, um, and so we thought we would rebuild the building. Um, and then cut it open very precisely to reveal um, a, a, an Indigenous garden. So Indigenous people believe that, uh, which is very different to our kind of four seasons, Western four seasons in Australia, um, and they operate in completely different ways. Um, so we wanted to cut it open precisely, not sort of jagged like it had been ruined, but because it was a work essentially about structural racism, um, uh, we um, we wanted our our kind of intervention to be very precise. So it was as if the Treasury Building was a kind of colonial ruin that had been recolonised by this by this garden. And on the interior of the walls behind glass were thousands of Yuani's black yams 
hanging um, hanging um, hanging by wire. So it was a contemplative space for students. It was a performance space if they wanted it. Um, you know, yes, it was a garden, um, a, a kind of wilder garden actually than a normal garden. Not not a garden you had to kind of tend to, if you like, that it went through its own kind of seasons. And we worked with a range of collaborators, including an Indigenous uh, landscaper um, called uh, Charles Solomon, who, who did the work. A very expanded um, project of um, um, team of people. This is uh, some of the examples of the Indigenous um, flora and fauna we wanted to use. Um, and uh, this was just a, a map showing the, the way the garden was going to grow over, over time. So start small and this um, gradually colonise this building. So look, I can probably leave it there, Agum, and take questions. I've got other projects in there to talk to, um, but I, I think I've sort of overdone my, overdone my welcome. Okay, thank you so much. A big, a big round of applause. Thank you so much for your very insightful presentation, Professor Martin, and also uh, for sharing about your works. Uh, it's really amazing to know how the, the, the map has done very extensive projects, and especially in, in the context of interdisciplinary research. Um, and we have actually already some questions that I would like to uh, just read from the Q&A box. Yeah. And this one is coming from Budi Adinugroho, one of our lecturers actually at ITB. And he has mm -hmm. just finished uh, his uh, PhD also in, in public art. So his question is about how, how the, the, uh, uh, the pandemic brings questions about the meaning of space. Because the space, uh, he said that it's not possible uh, to define space as only physical space because the social distancing also the lack of mobility uh, have make us you know uh, we have to readdress our, our question again the position and, and the meaning of public art space especially maybe because uh, what you what you presented just now uh, uh, relate to the, mm. the term permanent permanent public space which is very physical and and tangible. Yeah. Would, would you like yes, to, to it's comment a very on good that question. first? Yeah, it's a very good question. I mean, I chose to show you works that are, um, because it's the bulk of what we do, um, but um, certainly when we're teaching, um, you know, we teach to obviously a range of publics, not just, um, you know, um, work that exists in physical space, but the digital publics. I mean, you would, you know, one could argue, and it's obviously true that um, the the most public public art is online now. You know, in that that space, that public is the biggest public. So of course, it's uh, you know, it's, I don't know if it's the subject of your PhD, but it's an excellent it's an excellent subject for PhD. Um, um, and you know, we are so busy doing these public art projects. Um, and through the pan pandemic, in fact, it never stopped. I mean, construction, because we're tied to the construction industry, um, those those projects, um, construction industry didn't really shop, stop at all. So, um, so we haven't had sort of really had a lot of time to reflect back on that. But I suppose one of the things is um, the speculative projects we do exist only online. They don't exist um uh, in physical space and like that last project I just showed you that whilst that was a project that was you know difficult to not get um, when I look back on it um, it was kind of an amazing and fairly radical project to speculate on to 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 conceive of and I suppose that's one of the things it's a bit like permanent public art has a lot of limitations on it you know around materiality you know and and all the kind of you know restrictions that I outlined earlier. Um, temporary public work. Um, temporary public works clearly have less. You know you can drop something in more quickly. You don't have the same material restrictions. You know and so on. And works that exist online don't have any of that. So there's a lot more freedoms. Uh, really well. I mean that's a that's a 
freedom is going to be something we can talk about. But um, um, of course, there are restrictions in that space, but certainly there are a lot of freedoms working in that space. So, um, you know, it's a good question. We should do more in that space. And I think with the new research arm, you know, we can we can we can do that. I mean, certainly that's why we're involved with something like Memo Magazine, which is an online journal. Um, and we, you know, we publish on Instagram and, and we have a presence in that space as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I hope that answers your question, but it's a good question. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'd like to continue with the next question. This is from Tisa Granicia. Uh, her question is about, uh, uh, well, she asked about your opinion on the idea of existing art in public space uh, with regards to the climate change that we are facing now. Um, what, what's the, what's the, the challenge for, you know, in terms of maybe construction and also it deals with the materiality, materiality of the works that has to be adjusted with the, you know, climate change. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Also a really great question, particularly in relation to this conference. I mean, I sort of refer to it a little bit, um, you know, little things like not using concrete, but using GRC or different forms of concrete. You know, if you work in the construction industry, you know, and speak to a lot of architects, they're pretty set in their ways, a lot of them, um, how they work. Um, and, and it's very hard with very ambitious scale work, particularly in terms of engineering, to switch, you know, materials, say, say from something like kind of concrete. So it's, it's, it's taking probably a bit too long. Um, you know, I mean, in the faculty, we have, we've developed an environmental sustainability audit and so we're kind of auditing every project we do, which has just sort of happened. And and I guess from that, that's going to, you know, we think about it obviously with um, with the kind of energy expend on every project, on every permanent public project. And we, we do try and measure those things. We could do more. I mean, one could say that perhaps public, permanent public art is a bit redundant in the age of climate change. Um, and maybe there are other things that one ought to be spending their money on. Um, and we don't disagree with that, but um, certainly uh, in the economies of uh, art production where there are kind of diminished opportunities and artists work in a range, range of areas, this sort of, you know, possibilities for public interface um, um, to construct new narratives, to draw attention to, you know, urgent problems, both socially, environmentally and so on, you know, public art still has a, a, a really important place to play in that. Um, so I guess it's, you know, weighing that up as well. But, yeah, it's something we're, we're, we're kind of always thinking through. And, you know, some of our artists like Nick Mangan, his work is really about climate change and materiality. Um, so we have a number of projects that we've been shortlisted for that we're awaiting the outcome for outcome of and they're, you know, fundamentally about, you know, um, um, not just the question of climate change, but also a way of making things using kind of recycled materials or using different modes, you know, so, yeah. Thank you. Um, I'd like to continue with the, with the question from an anonymous attendee, but I'd like also to uh, uh, combine it with other question below. So this is about how the uh, Monas Art Project can balance between the theoretical and empirical aspects because it's part of the uh, the academia or the academic environment. And I think this also relates to a question from Randy Pandita who asked how uh, artists in academic context as in, you know, self-thought or uh, you know, auto, yeah, self-taught artists, uh, whether they are also a part of the, the, the project as being also provided with um, uh, facilities and supports. Yeah, I mean, that's, um, that's a good question. Um, well, they're both good questions. Um, so thank you for those. Um, uh, yes, we are always reaching out, not just to, I mean, it made sense for us to develop around a kind of cohort of staff that were working intensively in this space. But um, increasingly, as we've gone on, we're, we're very interested in inviting other people in. So we've, you know, uh, we've invited lots of artists in who are not part of academia, um, excellent artists, um, nonetheless. And so 
I guess with the expansion of MAP, um, I mean, what happens with public art projects is commissioning bodies are very worried about whether one can realise one or not. And so they tend to, um, they tend to favour uh, projects that have a kind of ca have proven capacity to deliver things. And so MAP has developed quite a track record now so that we can offer that um, to other artists. So, yeah, we, we've invited a number of artists from outside. And, in fact, that photo that I showed you of all the people working, a lot of those people are not in academia. So we invite them in um, and provide them with that support. Um, the, 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 the good question about the kind of balance between, I guess, the theoretical and empirical of, um, of uh, academia, um, I said, my MAP runs, unlike those other labs, we probably run quite differently what we do. Um, we run more like a kind of design office in the sense that all our money to pay for staffing and resources has to come from the projects we we go for. So we don't go for traditional research grants, which is much more that kind of theoretical model uh, around a kind of research theme. Um, we we and with something we're doing, we're you know developing this kind of new sort of cell of scholarship, I suppose, and that's a way to kind of include all these kind of great thinkers that are sort of writing around the space. Um, but um, um, but um, but, you know, because we are sort of much more engaged with the world, with industry, we're much more sort of public facing rather than internally facing, um, which has its advantages and disadvantages. I mean, I think the thing about the theoretical is that it, it kind of um, enables you to be perhaps more radical in the way you think about work. Problem also within uh, larger institutions, which all of us feel is the kind of pressure on research and pressure on research income. I don't know if you have that in Indonesia. Um, so if you don't get the grant, you don't exist. So we 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 found a way to um, use the expertise we had to connect to the world, and now sort of building back into the sort of research, uh, more traditional kind of research that way. So. We do it in part through MAP, we do, you know, um, through, you know, publishing, and we do it through our teaching. Um, we, we, we do it in, in so, we, well, I mean, we're a practice-based faculty, so we regard our research, our creative practice as equivalent to theoretical research. So we, we regard the research as equivalent. And I think it's really important to kind of understand that and to recognize that it's one of the, it's one of the battles for uh, fine art, um, it cultures existing inside, um, um, you know, STEM-based institutions. But that, and, we, you know, we seem to have to argue for it every year that we're there, but what we do has its own uh, equivalent, you know, type of research, and it should be um, acknowledged as, as such. And so there are lots of PA artists who do PhDs in Australia, as there would be there, and so on. So we're all kind of fitting into that kind of structure, whether it's right, whether it's wrong, you know, the jury's probably still out on that. But that's basically, you know, and they're basically it. And uh, uh, I think um, there are a number of artists who have developed their work through PhDs and inside institutions that have what one would call a research practice now, which is um, clearly quite different to, um, you know, artists who exist, you know, just in the market, not just in the market, but in the kind of marketplace and belong to the sort of individual creative genius model. So, um, you know, we, we sort of are a hybrid across the two. And so we, we're sort of bridging that gap on my frozen uh, and um, bridging that gap. But uh, I'm very interested to see how this kind of research culture is affecting art production. Mm -hmm. it's, it's true uh, because I think we are still also facing the same thing here in ITB, <laughs> the situation. Yes. And I'd like, yeah, yeah. I'd like to continue maybe with the... Uh, question, well, there are two questions that I think relates to each other. First is from an anonymous attendee about how the MAP uh, built the relationship with the stakeholders, particular in particular for public art space. And then there is also a question that uh, comes from Parlindungan Siregar about whether you can share maybe uh, any <clears throat> experience of you know negotiating the idea of 
doing the, the, the works at the public space with government regulations, whether uh, you, f- you face any, you know, uh, conflicts or arguments maybe with the regulations. Oh, yeah, God. It's all arguments. Um, uh, well, I mean, I think one of the things that I... I said before that a lot of us, um, and we always said that we were prepared to stay in the room in order to kind of give up good, good, good opportunities to excellent artists and artists that were perhaps sort of, um, and, and sort of opening up new challenging modes. Um, um, that, that, and it's, uh, clearly it's sort of ongoing, ongoing um, research and ongoing battle. Um, it really depends, you know, I mean, they used to say the bigger the, the, bigger the team, the, you know, the bigger the uh, panel, the, the worse the art, you know, that it become art by committee and so on. I guess I sort of feel like you can potentially work around that through kind of patience and advocacy. So that's a sort of other thing that we do is constantly, I mean, sometimes we advise local councils because in Australia, um, you'll see that the major city, major councils in the major cities like Melbourne and Sydney and Brisbane and so on, they all, they all, they all have a devoted amount of money to public art. They also have um, a public art strategy in place. But as you move out into, you know, each suburb is in part of a, a different kind of um, precinct, if you like, or council, and they have their own, you know, councils. Uh, and when you, when you get into those areas, um, it's very hard, you know, they might not have a public art strategy or might not care. And so some of them, you know, are interested in establishing it. And so we go in and we talk to them and about the different modes um, that one can, uh, different modes of public art, you know. So so that's part of that sort of um, relationship, I suppose. Um, I mean, Perth in Australia is the only place that has legislated um, percent for art committed, and they've committed over $50 million to public art over the last, since 1989. So there's lots of work in those communities. I mean, that's mainly money from the mining industry, but um, it's um, it's important nonetheless. It has provided opportunities. So it doesn't really answer your question about, you know, negotiating when you, when you get it. I mean, there are all these stages with public art. You know, the submission is sort of the easiest part, you know, and putting it in and getting the, the you know, not the easiest part, but it's, in terms of the bureaucracy, it's sort of the easiest part. As soon as you get it and you're working with a big council, the processes can be mind-numbingly kind of um, bureaucratic. Um, And that's the other reason why we have the skill base of architects in there, because that's what they're used to doing. That's what architects do as a rule, you know, in these large, you know, architecture firms, you know, someone will just be sort of devoted to um, this kind of, it's a highly, it's like film industry, highly collaborative, highly partitioned, you know, certain people good at negotiating, certain people good at, you know, visualising certain people good at designing, you know, and so forth. And so you need that skill set and expertise and patience, you know, that artists sort of don't have. So you either sort of develop it or you get others to help you, I suppose, mm-hmm. to answer that mm-hmm. question. Mm-hmm. So it's really a, a teamwork and uh, yeah. needs mm-hmm. really uh, collaborative efforts to do that. Absolutely and, collaborative. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I think the difference uh, with Indonesian context is that we don't have like a system in which you know artists can submit proposals to the government. That's mm-hmm. that's a thing. That's probably uh, one of the big difference. Um, if I may, I I'll... I think that was one of the questions are going around. Mm-hmm. You know how 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 we get it. Whether you just you know you are commissioned directly or whether you apply for it. I mean sometimes you can get mm-hmm. commissioned directly and sometimes you can propose something to those councils and open up your own opportunities yeah um, yeah 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 well most of the public artworks especially like you know monuments memorials uh in yeah. the cities in indonesia are mostly uh, commissioned by by the government so that they they have yeah, their own right. agenda with that and yeah. so uh, that's maybe, offering something else yeah mm, mm. yeah well i i have a i have my own Question actually, if I may, yes. we still have a few minutes because it's it's very interesting for me to see uh, 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 how MAP also works with uh, this group of artists called disabilities, and I yes. think this is this is uh, something that we we rarely done or n- never been done as far as I, as I know in Indonesia. 
I, w- I wonder if you can share us more about the main challenge uh, working with them. Well, I, I've been on the board of that theatre company for a long time, I must say, and I've worked with them for over eight years. So I'm kind of intimate with that company um, and how they work. That company, um, yeah, so it's been going for 30 years and it really does rely on the infrastructure. We just talked about teams of people around the actors and artists um, to, to help them generate the work. Um, so, so on the one hand, um, and that allows them to intersect with opportunities, but also gives them a safe place, safe place in which to work, I would say. Um, so when we did our um, workshop with them, by all means, it was, you know, there were lots of things I would do again. It's complex to work with, with, with those communities um, just because, you um, you know, every one of them, as everyone else is, is highly individual and has their own particular imaginations and their own particular interests. So if you haven't established relationships with them over a long period of time, you know, it's perhaps hard to read those. And, you know, making work uh, is, making any artwork makes people vulnerable uh, on some levels. You're exposing yourself, of course, uh, in lots of ways. So, um, so I, I think that, you know, we had a very simple approach to it, which was simply for me to describe the opportunity um, and then to work work alongside them, all drawing, all doing the same thing, converting it to digital. Um, and, you know, so it was a sort of a simple conversation. I think the thing that I was sort of mindful of was tapping into the things that they were essentially interested in, you know, like... I know that, um, say, that Ganesh versus the Third Reich, that work developed, as I remember it, um, because one of the actors was obsessed with Ganesh. You know, so it's simply, or it was around that kind of obsession. So Robbie had this obsession with drawing these, these beautiful, powerful drawings, and he would do lots of them. It was You couldn't really talk to him, but he just let him go. He was completely energised by it. And so they, he produced these extraordinary things, um, and it was valuing that to us. You know, it was valuing the worlds they were kind of constructed and, and intersected. I don't know if that answers your question. I'm certainly no expert in it. You know, and each time we go and work with them, we learn new things. And I think actually, you know, they're, you know, it, I would look up back to back theatre on, on the website and look at on, online and see what they've done. I think that would be, you know, really helpful to you, Gordon. And I'm happy mm-hmm. to sort of put you in touch with them if you want. Yeah, that'd be great. That'd be great. I think, yeah. Uh, so the willingness to be like open-minded and you know, <clears throat> sit in the, in the equal position is very important. Okay, I, I think, think that's true with all the workshops. Actually, be open-minded and um, be open. Don't make it too complex. Mm-hmm. Actually, make mm-hmm. it a safe place to work. No mm-hmm. idea is dumb. You know, all the rest of it. Mm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I. Uh, we have to, <clears throat> yeah, learn more about that from you, Professor. And um, I think we have come to the end of the first plenary session today. And uh, thank you so much, Professor Carl Morton, uh, for all the thoughts and, and sharing. All the best for your upcoming projects. And uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for uh, allowing me to share some of our projects with you. It was great to be here. It's been great. It's um, I been hope great. it made a valuable contribution, but um, please contact uh, me or contact us in Melbourne um, whenever you're in Melbourne or if you want to exchange things online. And if there are people with follow-up questions to this, just send them, send them my email and uh, I'm happy to, um, to open up a dialogue with anyone who wants to, wants to have it. That's great. That's great. Thank you, Professor Morton. And uh, I'll, I would also like to thank all the conference participants. Thank you for your participation and contribution. Um, I, I would like to end this uh, session. Uh, thank you so much. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And uh, Sabrina, over to you.